Good morning. Good to see you all this morning on this beautiful Memorial Day weekend. We heard that there was going to be bad weather, but with the exception of what, about 20 minutes yesterday? It's been a beautiful, beautiful weekend. Thank you for being present on this day of celebration where we get to celebrate God's presence among us, where we get to celebrate God's spirit, where we get to celebrate the privilege and the gift of community. I get a unique vantage point from where I am, and it's so wonderful to see as we gather the closeness, the relationships that are rooted and grounded in our common faith. And so I pray that we would never take for granted our gathering on Sunday mornings. You may have noticed that we moved the lecterns back up on, if we were Episcopalians, we would call this the chancel. Some of you are glad about that. I'll just give you a little bit of word of why we moved it down in the first place. We had looked at one point at the possibility of bringing our services together to having both a blended service of traditional as well as contemporary. And we were floating that a little bit to see if we made some changes here and there, how that might go. And we realized that the traditional folks like their services traditional and the contemporary people like their services contemporary. So we're going to honor that. We're going to try something a little bit different. This is not about me. This is about you all, because you know that I am perfectly comfortable with one of those microphones on and down on the floor. But in honor of this traditional service, 
I'm going to start speaking from this lectern. I'll be here to honor your traditions and customs. And I also know that for some of you, you it's been mentioned to me, you get distracted when I go from side to side on the chancel. So I'll be here from this point forward, and some of you will celebrate that. And again, this is to honor you. As far as announcements that are concerned beyond what's printed in your bulletin, I would just share with you um, that Beth is away this week taking a much needed vacation. Uh, she'll be back about halfway through the week, but she's gone this Sunday. And Deborah Roebuck is filling in for her, and she has been practicing di diligently, and she is a gift to this community in so many ways and does so many things. I don't know anyone who knows the Bible better than Deborah, do you? No one in the history of Christianity, someone who was just devoted to her faith, and this is another expression of it, so we are grateful for her. Uh, Jillian is away as well. Um, start, sometimes she refers to him as Little Robert. There's nothing little about her son, Robert, and they're in a baseball tournament this week. There will be a number of them, but this was one she had an opportunity to go of, and she'll actually sacrifice. It comes with this vocation, but there'll be others that she won't be able to, to attend, but we're glad that she's able to do that this week. Um, Lee Parker is with us, and I mentioned him because he is a member of the local NAACP, and this Friday they're having their annual fundraiser. It will be on Hackney Avenue um, in the Family Life Center where we gathered as a people of faith. And he has tickets. Two left? Well, actually, I need two tickets. Can we order more if they're needed? Okay. So that is an event that I, it is my privilege to be able, I was invited to speak at that event. That'll be this Friday. And again, it is a fundraiser. Tickets are $25 and they'll provide dinner that evening as well. And now I invite you, if you have any announcements, to share them at this time. Anything in the life of the church that I failed to mention or weren't in the bulletins. And then later in the service, we'll have an opportunity to share our joys and concerns. Damon. I'll just mention real briefly a little something about what you see at the back of your bulletin. It says for next Sunday, dedication of the free food pantry. Just explain oh, yeah. what that is. Yes. Um, you have probably seen a few of the little free libraries in town. It's like a little small mini home on a four by four post. There's one at uh, Washington Park, one at Haven's Garden, I think one downtown, and they provide free books. So the idea was to do a little free food pantry and install it here on the church grounds. And CIA has agreed to sustain that with, uh, with foods. And it would be a, a free service to anyone in our community that they could come up and they could get uh, any kind of foods. It would be non-perishable foods that we would pr provide in that. Um, my art classes did some designs. Uh, so they were at the beginning part of this. And then we handed the designs over to the construction class at the high school and they're in the middle of putting this together now so what I'm excited is that the kids got to be part of the process and they really got their hands into it and as I told them chances are as you're sitting at your table thinking of different uh, designs for this that you may be a part of the family that will be putting food in and chances are there's a kid sitting next to you that might be taking that food so um, they are part of our community and they're part of the process so, to get back to my original point, at 1040 next Sunday is when we're going to do the official, I guess, dedication for that. So you all are welcome to come if you get here a little bit before the service. We'll be out there. We'd love to have you meet some of the students that I'm going to invite to, that were part of the process. I'd love for you to meet them. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. Yeah, yeah. There currently also is one behind Rachel Kay's Bakery, so there is another in town. But as we know... One, one service to provide food is certainly not enough in a community like ours, so we're going to provide another one. Thank you to CIA, yes. <laughs> Other announcements? All right, well, I invite you to stand as you're able. Greet a neighbor close by, and then we will begin with our opening hymn.
Dear God, thank you for blessing us with your presence and this beautiful day that we can come together as your children and church family in your house to learn more about you and your love, Lord. Guide us and instill in us the knowledge and the peace and the love of your word. Bless the ones that could not be here today, Lord. Lay your loving hands, healing hands on the ones that are sick. Comfort them and guide them and give them peace and love. Guide over them and keep them safe, Lord. Also, bless the poor and less fortunate. Wrap your loving arms around them, Lord. And still in us the power to show them love as well. And invite them into your house. Show us the way to welcome them into your loving arms. Because everyone is welcome in your house, Lord. As we worship today, guide us and watch over us, Lord. And in your holy name, we lovingly pray. Amen. Amen. Scripture uh, comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you do not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. These are the word of God for the people of God. I invite you to share any joys or concerns that you have at this time. We certainly want to keep Kim Woolard in our prayers. As you might imagine, she and Mitch celebrated many, many years of a, an extraordinary relationship, and this is a difficult time for anyone who's gone through that number of years in that kind of close relationship. You can imagine, I know that she appreciates cards, and for those of you who are closest with their visits, are very important. Any other concerns. Michael is recovering well, Allie Good. We had a chance to visit with him this week and I was thinking, my goodness, his spirits were so high that I, I just was honestly in awe of that, his profound faith and his spirituality. I talk about how joy is something that transcends happiness. 
because happiness is related to circumstances. And being at Ridgewood, and several of you have been there, you know that that's anything but a perfect circumstance. But his spirit and his joy and his sense of humor like he has, like no other, was all present. So we celebrate that. We want to keep Doug in our prayers. He'll be undergoing surgery next week. And we'll pray for a speedy recovery and that those caregivers will be inspired by the Spirit of God. They are extraordinarily gifted in what they do. And I use that word gifted intentionally. And we know that caregivers are an extension of God's care and God is the great caregiver. So we will keep you in our prayers, Doug. Any others? that you all might have. Any other joys? Carolyn Parsons, will be having surgery Carolyn Parsons will be having surgery Wednesday. Well, it is always a joy to gather as a people of faith. It's a joy to be able to share even our, even our concerns. And we can be joyful and rejoice in all circumstances, not for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. And we rejoice because, as Phil just prayed so eloquently a moment ago, God's love is with us, and God's love is the assurance that all that has been broken will be healed, all that has been lost will be restored. So with that in mind, let's go to God in prayer together. We pause this morning, God, to remember we remember in the busyness as well as in the monotony of our lives that we all too often forget our first love. And in so doing, we forget the very source of all that is good and necessary and meaningful and enriching. But at moments like this, we are grateful to remember you. In the midst of grief, we are given hope when we remember you. In the midst of sickness and disease, we are given assurance when we remember you. In the midst of financial difficulty, we receive the abundance of your love when we remember you. What a privilege it is to gather as a community of faith, a community of faith, a community of trust, a community of love, a community committed to the well-being of our brothers and sisters and to the greater community in which we reside. As people of faith on this Memorial Day weekend, it is not lost on us that while we celebrate the courage, the honor, and the sacrifice made by men and women serving in the armed forces, we also lament the very need for military. This weekend, we are caught between sentiments of pride in our military, and yet in light of your vision and your design for our world, we are shamed by the causes that seem to make militaries inevitable. Although we were created to be one people, we are divided along lines of race and class and nationality and social economic status. We're divided over self-interest at the expense of others. We're divided over injustices where some work too hard for too little and others have much but remain empty. So this morning we ask that you would turn our hearts of stone into hearts of compassionate love. We ask that you would open our eyes to the ways that we are complicit in the suffering of others, the ways in which we are complicit in the causes of division and fractured community. And having opened our eyes through the power of your Holy Spirit, give us the resolve to repent, to turn away from the sin that separates us and turn toward your relationship restoring and redemptive love. On this Memorial Day weekend, let us recommit ourselves to making of this world a new heaven and a new earth where everyone is treated with dignity and respect and with the infinite worth that they possess simply by virtue of being created in your image. In the words of the great prophet Isaiah, let us beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. Let our nation no more lift up sword against nation and may we study war no more. And in the words of the greatest prophet and teacher this world has ever known and taken from the most famous sermon ever recorded, may we love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And as we pray the prayer he taught us, place within us the will to fulfill his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive 
save us from our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Let us pray. As we worship you here today, dear God, we are so thankful for the love that we have received through Jesus Christ, a love that is so beautifully symbolized by this bread and this cup. Let, us, let it remind us of Jesus Christ, that he lived and died and rose again, and through your spirit lives in each of us gathered here this morning. Father, you, we would ask that you would teach us the secret of your grace, that it is in giving we receive, and it is in pouring ourselves out in humble service that we share Christ's love with the world. Amen. <coughs>
Generosity, stewardship, these are valuable virtues to practice. Today we are called to give God our best, not because he needs our gifts, God doesn't, but the world needs our gifts. We're called to give for two reasons. First, because he's worthy of our gift. And second, because it's a tangible way that we can put him first in our lives. A gift that honors God is one that reflects our hearts. So let us receive the tithes and offerings.
hedge of protection around these gifts and these offerings to glorify you, Lord, for the future. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. <laughs> invite you all to be seated. Yes. I tell you, whether we were coming, we are having fun. We had a divine appointment with our traditional service one way or another, did we not? And we are so grateful that God's spirit shows up in any number of ways through traditional and contemporary and somewhat contemporary and somewhat traditional and the important part is that God shows up. Amen? Amen. And God is present with us this morning. We can be assured of that. We're going to read one of the more familiar passages, particularly the latter part of the scripture reading for this morning. The reading comes from the gospel according to St. John. We're reading from the third chapter. This is an important reading for a number of reasons and we look forward to diving into that after our special music in just a few moments. Now there was a Pharisee, a person who was a strict adherent to the law, a very pious, a very sincere, a very dedicated person of faith named Nicodemus. And he was a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And interestingly, Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after, after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, teacher of Israel, you are a teacher, and yet you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, and yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world may be saved through him. May our lives be transformed by the reading and hearing of these words. Amen. Amen. Oh, 
Thank you both. We are continuing, this is the second part of what will be a three-part series, unfortunately, or for some of you, fortunately, you all won't hear the third part of this message next week. I would remind you that our <coughs> Congregational Care Minister, Robert Caton, will be here. He's going to be coming on the fourth Sunday of each month, and because he had ha had a conflict uh, earlier, he was not going to be able to be here this month, so he's going to come the first week in June, which is next Sunday, so we'll look forward to his presence and the message that he will deliver, and you'll discover that he and I, I believe, will complement one another well. By that, I don't mean we're a mutual admiration society. I mean, he makes up for some of uh, my deficiency. I don't know how I can compliment him in that regard, but I know that he is gifted and he has uh, a style and a presentation that is unique to him in the way that God has enriched his life and called him to share the message. But we are continuing with our series on one agenda, one agenda. For those of you who have not been with us and have no idea what we're talking about, we recognized some months ago that we are called to be an evangelistic presence in this community. What does that mean? We are called to share in word and deed the good news of Jesus' message. And we wanted to identify just what was Jesus concerned about? What was his preoccupation? And we saw that just a few moments ago in the writing according to the gospel according to St. John. Nicodemus comes to him at night and says to him that we know that you are a teacher that comes from God because you couldn't do these signs if God's presence was not with you. And immediately... Jesus begins talking about the kingdom of God. And again, Nicodemus tries to clarify about how we can be born again. And again, Jesus begins to talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the reign of God, to use contemporary language, the way of God, the will of God, the law of God, the rule of God, how God operates. That was what Jesus was concerned about. And we ought to take pause because Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was someone who was dedicated, committed to his faith. He was a person of sincerity. He was a leader. He had learned a great deal, and he had become a teacher himself of the people of Israel, as Jesus acknowledged. And yet, he couldn't quite grasp what was at the heart of God, what was the primary concern of God. If we are not careful those things that were meant to be means to an end become an end in themselves. Our traditions, our rituals, our habits, our practices, those are not the ends in themselves. Those are a means to an end, and we have to be extremely careful about that. We recognize that we are called to share the message of Jesus, to become like Jesus. We saw 
last week that our mission statement as the Christian Church Disciples of Christ is to be and to share the good news. Think about that for a moment. We are called to be and to share the good news of Jesus the Christ, witnessing, loving, serving from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. We are called to become people in whom God's way, God's rule, God's way reigns supreme. And as we do so, we cannot help ourselves but want to witness from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. One of the remarkable qualities that Jesus had was that he could communicate with people wherever they were. He did not have to use his own symbols, his own language, and then hope that they could understand what he was talking about. He could tell stories, everyday stories, that people could relate to. He could tell everyday finite stories to communicate the transcendent and the infinite. And we as people of faith want to be able to do that very thing. We are called to be and to share the good news of Jesus the Christ. And so we began to ask ourselves probably about a year ago, how can we communicate beginning with Washington and beyond? There are a number of people who gather on Sunday morning every week here in this place. We have Methodist brothers and sisters. We have Baptist brothers and sisters. We have Presbyterian brothers and sisters. We have non-denominational, we have charismatic, we have independent, and all kinds of churches that people attend. And this is not primarily about church. This is not primarily about institution. This is about a life-changing, life-enriching relationship with God. That is what is primary. That was Jesus' concern. And we began to ask, how can we communicate with this community, because if they were interested in church language, they would know it by now. Or they may already know it, and they're finding that there's not a great deal of power or meaning in those words and in that language for them. And so how could we begin to communicate with people beyond these walls? And we realized, and again, for those of you who have been with us, this may sound redundant, but it bears repeating for those of you who haven't. We hear in our world this talk about agendas, whether or not... A political leader is going to be in line with Trump's agenda. Or what about that liberal agenda or that progressive agenda or that evangelical agenda? There are all these agendas and we're suspicious of agendas. Yesterday I was driving. We needed to go to Greenville to pick up a few things and I noticed there was a bumper sticker that said Clinton and Kane. And there was an arrow that was pointing to the right, which I think meant progress. That was forward from how you were looking. We know that Hillary doesn't really lean to the right. I think we could probably all agree with that, right? She probably leans to the left as so-called progressives or Democrats or liberals do. And sometimes we say that Republicans or conservatives, they lean to the right. Is that correct? And so literally in our society, we are pulling at each other. We are pulling in different directions. And as I've said so often, some of us are more Democrat than we are Christian. We are more Republican than we are Christian. My concern is not primarily to align with the Democrat agenda. My concern primarily is not to identify with the Republican agenda agenda or any party's agenda or even a national agenda. If we want to be great, if there's a place in our history where we were great, we're great when we align ourselves with God's agenda, right? And so we started asking ourselves, what is God's agenda? And so there's an arrow that points up. God is not literally above us, but we think of God as being in the heavens. We want our agenda to be God's agenda. And at the center of that agenda is the cross. Cruciform, sacrificial love. Because so often in our world, whether it's individuals, whether it's a particular racial group, whether it is a political party, whether it's related to economic status, we don't tend to love people sacrificially. 
we tend to be self-oriented. What's in this for me? What will happen to me if this legislation is passed? What will happen to me if my church changes thus and so? What will happen to me if that direction is taken? What is central to our faith is the cross. And the cross is a symbol of sacrificial love that doesn't begin with me. It begins with us, which includes me. But we are persons in community. I am not an individual. You are not an individual. I know in our society sometimes we believe in individualism. There's no such thing. We wouldn't be here without someone else. We were created for community. Neither the community defines me, but there is no me apart from the community, and God designed it that way. We were created for relationship with God. We were created for relationship with one another. The very purpose for our being is for relationship with one another and relationship with God. And we're better able to do that as we grow in our spirituality. As we grow in the Holy Spirit. That is why we were created, to become the people that we were created to be. We were created in the image of God. We are created to grow in Christ-likeness, in God-likeness. Jesus is the Son of God. We are children of God. As we follow Jesus, we become the people we were created to be. We are called to grow spiritually. A number of years ago, as I was studying in a formal way, theology and the history of theology, one of the criterions for the mark of a great theologian was whether or not their theology had been consistent over the years. Was their theology the same after 40 years as it had been in the beginning? And I thought, well, that's a strange criterion. Aren't we called to grow? My prayer is that my theology will not be the same next week, much less if God grants it that I should live many more years. We're called to grow, and as we are called to grow, we are going to change. Growth requires change. And for those of us who are holding on to things as they are, we're constraining the operation of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're constraining the opportunity for growth in our lives. So we can all agree, I believe, that we're called to growth. We're called to spiritual growth. So where do we begin? If we're going to begin with this spiritual growth, I believe one of the things we need to get straight is our true identity. Paul says in his letter to the church in Rome, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. He goes on to say, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, Mother, Creator, the one who loves us more than we love ourselves, the, more, the one who loves us, more than any other created being loves us, it is the very spirit of God bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We are children of God. That's where we begin. We are children of God. To be a human is to be created in the image of God. Male and female, we created them, and anything God creates is good. Have we lost our way? Certainly. Are we all struggling with various challenges? Absolutely. Has any one of us arrived at this point? Of course not. But our primary identity, who we are, is children of God. And any thought, any statement, any perspective from another that says that we are anything but a child of God is just simply not true. I don't believe that a number of people are insincere. They're just wrong. We are children of God. And if we are going to grow spiritually, we're going to need to recognize who we are. And that is fundamental to our identity. 
As children and joint heirs with Christ, if we want to grow spiritually, we're going to have to be about God's mission, about Jesus' mission. A number of churches every now and then, usually unfortunately, when they begin to experience some decline, they go looking for a mission. What should our church mission be? You know, I've actually, in my immaturity, I've participated in a number of those discernment processes. What should our mission be? The concern is not what the church's mission is. The concern is, what is God's mission? And how do we know what God's mission is? We look to Jesus, because Jesus was the one that fulfilled God's mission. And what was that? Simply and yet profoundly, as you begin to read the scriptures, you'll see it over and over and over again. God's mission is the kingdom of God. It's the way of God. It's the rule of God. It is when God's ways and will are operative in our personal lives, I didn't say individual, our personal and in our corporate lives. That's God's mission. And by extension, that becomes our mission as the body of Christ. And so now what is that gonna mean? Where the kingdom of God is present, Everyone is equal. God, who had the highest glory, and many of us would say the highest status, emptied God's self and took on human form. This is from Philippians chapter 2. Took on human form. And not only took on the form of a human, but took on the form of a slave. The lowest possible status. What happens when God takes the lowest status? What happens to that status? It becomes the highest status. To say that we are equal is to bring no one down. It's to lift all of us up. We have infinite value. We have the highest status, one with one another, because we are children of God. There are four priorities currently within the Christian church, Disciples of Christ. Did you all know that as a denomination? One is that we would be a pro-reconciling, anti-racism church. Did you all know that? That's part of the 2020 vision. These are our priorities. Reconciliation is not limited to racism, but it certainly has to go through it because we still live in a world where racial inequality exists. Our second priority is to start 1,000 churches by the year 2020. Another priority was to transform 1,000 churches by the year 2020. Why would that be? So perhaps we could have a better witness. Perhaps we could continue to grow. Can, perhaps we would have the vitality, the life abundant that God desires for us. The fourth priority was to prepare ministers for those kinds of ministries. One of the things we have to do, we didn't realize it, sometimes we're more American than we are Christian. Sometimes our architecture reflects it. We place clergy, lift it up. That has a functional purpose, but if we're not careful, it can have another purpose, to elevate the people who are in the position that I happen to be in at this point, which is primarily one of teacher, by the way, from the biblical model. I've been here two and a half years now and am just now getting comfortable with visiting people. Do you want to know why? Because the first two and a half years I was seen as senior minister, pastor, preacher, my minister, placing me here and everyone else here. In the kingdom of God, we are all equal. I love being able to visit as a member of this community. But out of my love for you all, some of you didn't recognize it, out of my love for you all, I had to love you enough that you would be mad at me. As though I had thick skin that you don't have. It hurts when people criticize you. It hurts. But I loved you enough that you would be mad at me if it meant that I wouldn't continue a dysfunctional theology that placed me here and you here. 
Where the kingdom of God is present, we are all equal. Where the kingdom of God is present, justice is present. Everyone is given their due. And what does everyone do? For people of faith, we understand justice in a different way than most of our world. Our world still lives in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth mentality. If a harm has been done, there needs to be a punishment to meet it. That's not God's justice. God's justice asks, what does love require in this situation? Justice is whatever is necessary so that we can be in right relationship again. Jesus was willing to go to the cross to reveal God's justice. We misinterpret that sometimes, that God needed a punishment. God didn't need a punishment. God needed us to be in right relationship, so God would say, I will face your persecution. I'll face your mockery. I'll face your most heinous capital punishment and still say, I love you. Jesus will still say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Justice, from a godly perspective, is whatever is necessary so that we can be right again. And God says, even when I was the injured party, let me make it right. That's not the justice that some of us live by. If the kingdom of God, if God's agenda is going to be a present reality on earth that is as it is in heaven, we're going to have to get this justice thing right. Another aspect of it is freedom. Freedom is the ability to achieve purpose. Do you know there are people in this community that don't enjoy the freedoms that I would venture to say that everyone in this room enjoys? There are children who go home food insecure. There are people that are going to after school programs, thank God, because there may not be a meal when they get home. Someone was sharing with me that we take for granted their family members. They're all having to use the same towel. Sometimes there's not a parent at home, and it's not because they're neglectful. They're working too hard for too little. They're trying to make ends meet, and there's not enough resources to make them meet. And it's not because they're not motivated. It's not because they didn't follow the rules. They're not free because they can't achieve their purposes. As people of faith, we are called to use and leverage whatever freedom we have on behalf of those who are not yet free. And the mark of our freedom is our willingness and our commitment to align our will with the will of God. And the will of God is that no one would be hungry, that no one would be without life's basic necessities. Some of you say, well, Jacob, good gracious, this sounds heavy. I don't know if I want to be a Christian anymore. My goodness. <coughs> Here's the reality. Paul said it in pretty stark words. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This is not a matter of consequence. This is not a matter of God's punishment. This is like the law of gravity. This is the law of the universe, which is the law of love. Jesus said, I came that you would have life and have it more abundantly. Those who believe in me will have eternal life. When we believe in Jesus, we begin to experience that life. When we believe in sacrificial love, we begin to experience that life. As we grow in our spirituality, we are growing in love. Jesus told Nicodemus, if you are not born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of God. The writer of 1 John says it this way, those who love are born of God and know God, for God is love. When we begin to experience this love, as we begin to love as God loves, as we begin to love sacrificially, we begin to enjoy that life abundant. All of a sudden, we have that peace, which is not just a word. It's a reality. It's an assurance. It's a confidence. When we have the Spirit of God, when we grow in spirituality, 
like Michael Alligood, we can be in circumstances that we didn't create and over which we have no control and put a smile on our face and greet people who were coming to greet him as we grow in our spirituality. As we grow in our spirituality, we find that wholeness that we're all seeking, that longing, that pining of the human heart is found as we grow in the Spirit of God. Because as we grow in the Spirit of God, we're growing in the love of God. Because God is love. My prayer for us this morning is that we will continually seek spiritual growth and transformation that we will be and become the good news of Jesus the Christ, witnessing, loving, serving from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. Because if we do, our lives will be transformed and Jesus' prayer will be fulfilled. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. If there's anyone here, not sure what to do with myself behind a lectern. <laughs> if there's anyone here who has never made that confession of faith, we're making a confession in what is. We're acknowledging it is. It is whether we believe it or not. We finally come to that place where the light switch comes on and we recognize that really is. He really is. If we've come to that place and you want to make that confession of faith publicly and we invite you to come forward, for all of us, we may have seen Jesus in a new light and we can make that confession of faith right where we sit or stand. For some of us, we're looking for a community of faith and this community of faith is committed to God's agenda. We all have an opportunity to rededicate our lives to growing in the spirituality and the transformation that God desires. So I invite you to stand as you're able as we make our commitment.